Welcome to episode five of Talking Prisoner Presents. Today, our special guest is best known for his regular role in Home and Away, but also appeared in Neighbours before that. He also accidentally killed off one of Home and Away's fan favourites, Bobby Marshall. The public have never forgiven him for it. <laughs> also made guest appearances in several other Australian TV shows, including Blue Healers, All Saints, Offspring, and Mrs. Fish, sorry, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. He left acting following his exit from home and away. We are, of course, talking about Matt Stevenson, who played Adam Cameron. Welcome to Talking Prisoner Presents, Matt. Great to have you Thanks, here. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me. I killed Bobby and never worked again. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> uh, she's beautiful. Nicole, Nicole Dixon, now Nicole Bell. Nikki Bell, yes, yeah, she's a wonderful yeah, human. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that storyline shortly. Um, sure. So before we get into all the home and away stuff, can we just learn a little about your life growing up. Where did you grow up as a child? I was Melbourne based in the suburbs of Glen Waverley, Willers Hill. So, um, yep. Uh, and I was there really for most of my childhood uh, up until moving to Sydney to work on home and away when I was about 19, I think. Okay. What were you like at school and, and did you have a favourite subject or an unfavourite subject? Look, I was okay at school, but my heart wasn't in it. Um, <clears throat> I loved sport. I was pretty sporty and uh, I didn't mind uh, geography and uh, sciences, um, just the basic science stuff. I'm no scholar. I was more into the arts. When I was... Um, when I was five or six, I remember sitting in my beanbag at home and watching a show called Simon Townsend's Wonder World. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Yes. People of our vintage will. Simon uh, hosted this kid show and he had a dog, Woodrow, a dash hound. A dash hound, I think. Big dog. Um, yeah. no, and, yeah. and they used to cover stories, um, you know, that, that the kids could relate to. And one of the stories that they were covering on this occasion were schools that kids could go to to do the normal scholastic subjects, but also with an arts flavour. So you could go to a school to become an actor, singer, dancer. And I remember it um, so clearly today. It was a light bulb moment for me. I would have been five or six. And at that moment, I just said to myself, I'm an actor. It wasn't pretentious. It was um, just a real sense of knowing, um, which um, is kind of comforting when you know what you want to do with your life at such a young age. And I, so I went to my dad and said, oh, dad, I'm going to be an actor. And he said, no, you're not, son. Actors <laughs> drive cabs. He was an orphan, right? So he wanted to give me and my two brothers, one older, James, one younger, Chris, wanted to give us a good education. So he said, no, actors drive cabs. You're going to go to a good school and you're going to get a good education. You're going to get a good job. And then, um, so I was a bit bummed by that because I wanted to go to one of these schools. But um and then I told my mum I wanted to be an actor and she said, oh, that's lovely, dear. She's very supportive. So anyway, me and my two brothers ended up going to a school called Halebury College in oh, Keysborough. Wow. Yeah, your neck of the woods, Maddie. Um, and um, quite fortuitously, um, they had a really good uh, drama unit. Uh, Ian Rawlings and Stuart Bell, two of the heads of drama there, they were amazing men and really good mentors for me. And ironically... When I was 15, I was lamenting being at this school because I really wanted to go to an arts school. Um, the ABC came to the school when I was 15 and the principal announced in assembly one morning that they were going to audition for a lead role in a telly movie at lunchtime. So if you want to go along to the drama room at lunchtime, they'll be auditioning. And this was another light bulb moment for me. It was kind of almost like an out-of-body experience. So I haven't quite felt like that um, ever really, uh, it was like I was looking at myself, looking down on myself when the principal announced it. Um, and I just thought, wow, this is, um, this is the opportunity I've been looking for. So I went along at lunchtime and there was about 50 kids there. And I read this scene, Kathy Mueller was the director um, and they were looking for someone who hadn't acted before. They wanted to work with someone who was really quite raw. And they said, um, you will know at some stage towards the end of the day if we want you to come down to the ABC in Melbourne wow. for another audition, you'll know by the end of the day. 
So do you reckon I wasn't hanging out to find uh, something uh, yeah, to get some communication? So it was the last class of the day and um, I'm in uh, economics and which was a pretty dry subject for an artsy person. <laughs> and then the drama teacher comes in and he walks down one aisle and he hands a piece of uh, paper to Keith Burt. And I've gone, oh, shit, bertie has got one. I was happy for him. And um, then he walks up the other aisle and I can hear him behind me and he hands another one to Luke Elliott. And Luke's a really good actor. Luke's um, a professional actor um, and he's been in some amazing productions. His brother, Adam, won an Oscar for animation. Oh, Adam. And yeah. I thought, oh, yeah, I thought oh, I'm cooked here. <laughs> um and I was spewing and then I got a tap on the shoulder and um, he goes, Matt, here's one for you. And I was over the moon and it turned out that it was just the three of us that I think just the three of us had got a call up for the ABC um, on the weekend for a further test. So I went down and did a further test and I, um, I won that role when I was 15. So um, wow. I was over the moon. But you asked me what my childhood was like. I mean, I was absolutely obsessed about becoming an actor. I lived about an hour and a half to two hours bike ride from Channel 10 where they shot Prisoner and Holiday Island and Neighbours and all those shows, um, Carson's Law. And I, um, I used to ride my push bike, pack a lunch and sit outside the front of Channel 10 or Channel O as it was known back then and just visualise being on the set of one of the shows. This is how obsessed I was, right? And I used to pack a lunch and the security guards got to know me because I did it often. So um, when I won my role on Neighbours, it was one of the security guards that used to see me on the bike as a kid who let me in. And that was kind of a cool moment, right? So um, that lead role that I got when I was 15 in Breaking Up, um, uh, that was about a 12-week shoot in my year 11 year. So I couldn't perform in the school production I would, because I was on set performing in this production and I was the lead character uh, I was in every scene so it was a real baptism of fire two weeks after winning the role I'm on set working with the brilliant Candy Raymond who was in Don's Party oh, and Don's Nick Enright yeah I just and watched Nick that a few weeks ago Don's Party great movie yeah well Candy played my mum in that and um it was quite a successful telly movie it won quite a few Penguin Awards um so from there I got an agent and then in my year 12 year, I won a role in a mini series called My Brother Tom. Now, growing up being obsessed, wanting to be an actor, I knew all the 1930s films. I knew all the actors' names. My favourite film was The Great Escape. And when I won this role in My Brother Tom, the brilliant Scottish actor Gordon Jackson was working on My Brother Tom. And he was, of course, in The Great Escape. And I worked closely with him. So I'm on set talking to this bloke and he's telling me about Steve McQueen and Charles Bronson and James Garner and all these guys that I just idolised. So here I am as a 16-year-old kid, 17 at the time maybe, um, working with this guy from my favourite film, The Great Escape, and I was, I was just absolutely in awe wow. of, um, of him. And he was a gracious man. He's since <laughs> passed on, but he was, he's a, was a brilliant, very generous, generous man. I wasn't trained as an actor so all I did was kept my eyes and ears open and I learned from um, brilliant people like him um, so I had then got an agent off the back of that and straight out of school I won a lead role in a mini series called Dusty which was a film about it there was a film about a dog that was quite successful in Europe so they decided to make a mini series and Chris McQuaid played my uh, mum uh, Asha Ketty played my younger sister, the beautiful Asha. She was amazing. We had such a tight relationship back then. I think I was 18 and she might have been 13 or 14. Um, so that was quite successful too. That did all right. And then from there, I won my role in, um, in Neighbours. Um, so I won about a three-month role and um, playing a street kid called Skinner. And then Ian Smith, who played Harold on the show, was also writing for the show. He liked my character and wrote me back in. Wow. Um, yeah, which was awesome. <laughs> and um, 
the associate producer, Andrew Howie, at the time of Neighbours, was going up to Sydney to become the series producer of Home and Away, and he basically headhunted me from Neighbours to Home and Away, where I stayed for five years. So that's a pretty brief kind of storyline or, or summary of my timeline through acting up until Home and Away. Going back to um, Halberry for a minute, you said you mentioned the name Ian Rawlings. Was that Ian Rawlings, the actor? You took? No, no. Oh, okay. um, no, no, not not uh, not him. He, is, um, he was our drama teacher, oh, okay. um, along with um, Stewie Bell. Um, so both of them, both of them had uh, yeah huge influence on my life. Yep. All right. Well, we've covered a bit of childhood and growing up, Ken. So we should move to. Um... Yeah. I'm just skipping a couple of questions. <laughs> Getting to um, hobbies and what do you enjoy doing in your spare time if you've got any spare time? Yeah, certainly do. It certainly do, um, Ken. So I've got two beautiful daughters, 21 and 18. I'm married. Um, so, um, yeah, I've got a great family life. We try to spend as much time together as we can, although the kids are a bit older now. So I, um, I kayak a lot and fish from my kayak. I like being out in my kayak um, because no one else can fit in it. I'm a bit of a one-man wolf pack out in my kayak. I love that. So uh, fish for squid or snapper. Um, and I also play cricket with um, the local team, Lang Warren. Uh, we've got eight senior grades. It's a pretty healthy club, and I play in one of the lower grades. Um, still get around um, at the age of 52, but, you know, just play for um, just play for fun. Yeah, there's no, no sheep steaks there. It's, um, yeah, just for fun. So cricket, fishing, spending time with family. I like keeping fit too. Um, hanging out with family and friends and I do a lot of writing um, and also have been watching a lot of movies lately so yeah that's about me. Awesome and uh, just coming out of the pandemic how was life for you in lockdowns are you able to work from home? And yeah. I'm working from home I've been in business leadership roles both public and private for the last 18 years leaving home and away um, when the kids came along I needed um financial security and they've been really good to me so but uh, yeah um, I'm um, I've been working from home for the last couple of years and um, I really enjoy the pro the process of working from home uh, I find that I can support my staff uh, equally as well working from home obviously with um, you know technology advancements so um, yeah working from home has been great my understanding is I think Excuse me, we will be returning to our office environment um, in April. Okay. Yeah, with a, a slow launch back into the office. But, yeah. um, oh, the pandemic, yeah, look, it's been bittersweet for us because um, my wife lost her mum to COVID. She was wow. one of the early, one of the early Victorians to pass away from it. So we've, um, we've actually, I guess, seen, um, seen the trauma um, you know, on both fronts, you're yeah. losing someone to the disease. And then, of course, uh, the chaos that it creates, uh, taking away people's livelihoods, um, which has um, been pretty traumatic for a lot of people. So, yeah, look, as soon as we can keep, kick this beast to the curb, obviously, the better. I think collectively we've all had um, a couple of shitty years. But um, I tend to look for the silver linings in, um, in most things. and. I've really had a couple of really good solid years with my girls um, that I probably otherwise wouldn't have had. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think most of the young kids, you know, when they're grandparents and when they're taking their kids for their flu jabs and COVID jabs, I don't think it'll be missing out on the school sport that they'll think about. I I'm hoping that they'll be thinking about um, the valued time, the valued family time they got, right? Yeah, Which, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's been bloody interesting, but we've had enough of it now, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> it was right what you say, though. I mean, I spent so much time with my daughter, Grace, as well, 10. Um, we, we just got to do well, bike rides and walking. That was all, all you could do, but just spending time together. It was good. Yeah, it's priceless. Yeah. Can't pay for that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you actually cook? And if so, do you have a signature dish or is it? your wife that does the cooking 
My wife does most of the heavy lifting. Um, I cook on Thursday nights. That's takeaway. So I go and get the fish and chips. <laughs> now I cook. Um, I'm not bad on the barbie. I cook this dish. I Googled this dish and I've actually got it right. It's a chicken breast and you bash the chicken breast and you put spinach leaves and camembert and sun-dried tomato in there. Then you roll it and you um, wrap it in prosciutto. Oh, yum. And this honey mustard sauce. I've been nailing that one lately, but um, I don't have a massive repertoire. There's some pastas I like cooking, but because I'm into my health, sometimes um, I'm probably best known for cooking basic clean food. Yeah. So so bland, shitty tasting food. Yeah. The stuff that's good for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have um obviously before the pandemic, do you have a, f- a favorite holiday destination you like to go to? Yeah, my wife and I got married in Fiji. We got married on an island called Vatalele. And a mate of mine used to travel um a lot. Actually, when I was 18 before neighbors, me and I'd just gotten my license and my mate came around and he said, what are you doing? Have you got any work? And I didn't have any work. And he said, I'm going to Great Keppel Island. You want to come? I said, yeah, that sounds all right. And he goes, beauty, you can drive. And two hours later, we're in the car and we're driving from Victoria to Great Keppel Island. I spent three months up there. So we slept on the island for two nights or three nights. We got up there and we asked if they had any jobs and they said, no, they didn't. So we slept on the island that night and then we came back the next morning and we said, have you got any jobs? And they said, no, nah, the answer is still no. Someone's got to die for you to get a job here. So then we came back the third morning and we said, has anyone died yet? <laughs> and coincidentally, they needed to dig this long ditch to lay some um, telco cables. And they said, right, a few blokes dig this ditch. And it must have been about 100 metres long. It was only one by two or three. It was pretty shallow, but it was tough terrain. So we spent four days digging this ditch and then they gave us a job. I moved into the kitchen and he moved into the garden. And I used to wander the beaches at night, um, just thinking about my acting career. So I headed back to Melbourne three months later and then I got my neighbor's gig, but he traveled the world for about 15 years. Anyway, one of these places he went to was Vatalele in Fiji. And um, it was an amazing resort. Um, and it was too expensive, we thought, for my wife and I, but they were doing up this bureau. Um, and the price was quite economical. So we went to Vatalele for our honeymoon and it was just awesome. It was a la carte dining. It was all inclusive, all the drinks you want, only 12 bureaus. We didn't hear any noise with the other bureau at all. And you had these little golf flags. And all you had to do was pitch the golf flag out from your private beach and... Um, uh, one of the waiters would come up and say, what are you after? And I'd say, I feel like some lobster for lunch. And then two minutes later, you see the boys heading out just to the reef, diving down and getting your lobster for lunch. It was just amazing. It was the best experience. So um, I've been to Fiji three or four times um, and it's probably my favourite holiday destination, obviously, because of the honeymoon. Wow. I had a great experience with a tiger shark there, if you want to hear about that. I was... Um, I was on another island when I was about 21, 22, and I ended up diving with the um, owner of the island's son. And we went diving on this bommy, and the visibility was insane. I don't know how far you could see, but because it was so clear, it was amazing. And then he, he tapped me on the shoulder and he pointed to this tiger shark, which looked about 10 feet away from us, it was probably further. But this thing was massive. It wasn't so much the length, but it was the girth. This thing was just a beast, and you could see the tiger stripes on it. And he pointed to me and he said, come on, we better get out of here. Um, But I remember being really calm looking at it. It was just moving so slowly. It was just beautiful, so sexy in the water um, that I wasn't scared at all. He was shitting himself because he probably knew a fair bit more about it than me. But we got up there and our dive boat was about 50 metres away from us. So we signalled it to come in and he said that was an anxious wait for the dive boat to get to us. But to me, it was a beautiful experience. Sorry, I digress. No, it's great. <laughs> Can you tell us what TV shows you like and, and why? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not much of a... I'm not much of a drama TV series watcher. Um, 
I never got a chance to watch Home and Away when I was in it because we're working so busy that, yeah. um, as you would know, Ken, being a camera operator, I used to jump behind the camera when they were watching the playback because they used to film Home and Away on old VHS tapes, the old footy tapes, and they used to see whether there was um, you know, anything wrong, any glitches in the tape. So the cameraman had to watch it back. So I would watch it back. And that's probably the only time I really got to see my scenes back in Home and Away. But... Um, in terms of TV series, I really love Ricky Gervais's Afterlife at the moment. It's, um, geez, it's, it's beautiful, it's brilliant, it's crass, it's vulgar, but the sentiment there is awesome. It's about a bunch of misfits who are just trying to get through life as best they can and trying to work out what this crazy existence means. Um, I, th he's, I think he's made three series, two or three series, excuse me, and I've seen them all, and he's just brilliant. Um, so I'd have to say that um, Afterlife's my favourite by a mile at the moment. Do yourselves a favour, folks. Look it up. Yeah, my partner's actually watching it at the moment. She goes, you've got to watch this show. It's brilliant. And I've heard oh. it. She has it on, and I hear it in the background, and it sounds really good. <laughs> and watch the outtakes. Watch the outtakes on, um, yeah, Google them. They're even better. He's a funny um, man too, Ricky. He's... Um, Funny, but so clever. Yes. So clever. And I really love his philosophy on life, you know. I mean, he's. Um, I heard him in an interview. He said, oh, you know, this planet's been around for millions and millions and billions of years, give or take a few billion or million, depending on what your beliefs are, right? And he says, we only get to spin our wheels on this earth for 80 years if we're lucky. Um, so why not? make the time you've got on this planet chasing what you love, chasing what you're passionate about. He was having a go at all the trolls on social media. He was saying, why not lift people up as opposed to pulling people down? Why not find that passion that you've got and harness it and um, really spend your life doing what you love doing? And I think that message, I think you need a certain courage to be able to chase your dreams and you need a good plan. And I think, um, I think his message really resonates certainly with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Too many people trying to pull people down and uh, lifting them up always. Well, there are, yeah, there are. And um, I just say to those people, um, find your passion. Mm. You don't get long on this planet, find your passion and chase what you love. That's what I would say, because yeah, I mean, Social media wasn't around when I was on Home and Away, nor were mobile phones, thank God, because I reckon I would have been in a bit of strife. And um, um, so I wasn't really trolled all that much. I was trolled via um, fan mail. We used to get fan mail in our pigeonhole at work. Someone sent me a dead huntsman once when I killed Bobby. I'm hoping the huntsman was dead before they put it in the letter. Poor thing. So um, people take their soaps pretty seriously. Now, you, you were popular though at the time. I remember I was at school in 89 and 90. I think it was high school. And the, the female, the, the, the girls at school, even when you killed Bobby, still thought you were the best. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I think I was employed on Home and Away. So I joined Home and Away 18 months after it started to replace Alex Paps. Oh. Now, because the casting's so formulated, um, because a heartthrob left, had to be replaced with another heartthrob is what they called us. Now, heartthrobs in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, yes, you know, I mean, we got some attention from the opposite sex, but clearly not everyone. But, um, yeah, look, it's um, that, uh, that, that heartthrob tag is, um, is obviously branded for, for, for commercial reasons for the show. Um, but um, the fan interaction... I really loved um, the fan interaction was really for me, the nourishment of fame or celebrity. So when you become famous or you become a celebrity, if we want to call it that um, you get attracted and get offered a lot of flashy, bright, shiny stuff. Um, you know, the key to the city, um, uh, the restaurants, the travel opportunities, private planes, all the fancy stuff, but the stuff that always resonated with me and kept me grounded was the fact that you had the privilege of being able to make someone's day, um, particularly children or disadvantaged members of our community. 
I can tell you a story about that if you like. I um, So we worked on Home and Away five days in a row, um, Monday to Friday, and then on the weekends we'd be on the publicity trail somewhere in some state. Um, uh, and I remember on one occasion I met this young girl, beautiful young girl. She was with her mum. She was about 10. She was Down syndrome, just a beautiful, beautiful girl. And she wanted to meet me and she was so nervous that when she met me she was actually sick and she vomited on my t-shirt and she started crying and her mum was a bit embarrassed and I took my t-shirt off there was another one there promo one put it on and disarmed the situation um and 10 minutes later she's laughing she's having a great time and we'd made her day and two weeks later her mum sends me a fan mail thanking me and said oh look you made our daughter's day and you and the other cast members She's having a, she was so grateful to meet you and she's having a birthday party on Saturday and she can't wait to tell all, all her mates about the experience. And of course, on fan mail on the back of the envelope, you've got the return to sender, the residential address, right? And I wasn't doing anything that Saturday. So I thought I'm going to pop out to the birthday party and surprise her. So I went out there and um, of course she was surprised. She wasn't sick, um, <laughs> which was good. And I spent about an hour there and I left and, you know, I recognised that it was a good thing that um, I had done for them, but there was a lot of self-interest in it for me because the, if you want to call it the emotional nourishment from being able to provide an experience like that to someone, you can't pay for that stuff. You know, as soon as I got my mug on the idiot, on the idiot box, I was put in a privileged position to be able to do that. Wow. So amongst all the flashy stuff, it was those experiences that kept me grounded. And I wasn't the only one that did that sort of stuff. All the guys did it. Um, yeah. We just really valued, we just really valued our fan base because without a fan base, um, you don't have a business, you don't have a product. So I say thank you to all the fans, yeah. Jeez, what a beautiful story. She would have loved that, having you there. Yeah, she was awesome. She was yeah. awesome. I, I was just very fond of her. So, um, and I don't know where she is now, what she's doing now, but, um, you know, um, I, you know, those, those stories are, um, are one of many exchanges you get with, um, with fans. And then on the flip side, the ugly side of fame is um, I was assaulted in Oxford Street one night. I was walking up the street with... Um, with a girlfriend from the show at the time and a bloke tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and I can usually bullshit my way out of most things, but on this occasion, he'd knocked me to the ground and there was four of them. And um, there were a couple of, couple of security guards across the road came and busted it up. And I ended up getting a fracture in my eye socket or cheekbone. I can't remember now because it was a long time ago and three broken ribs. Um, and that was because, you know, we talked about, you know, haters, trolls, all that sort of stuff. That was just because I had my head on TV. So, I mean, those stories are few and far between, but, um, and the other stories, the emotional nourish stories, you know, they, they outweigh them um, 20 fold. But the reality is when you're a young man, a young person working on a soap with that profile, you really have to monitor are your movements yeah. look and on that occasion there was nothing i could have done but um i could have got myself into um a lot of sticky situations if i had have chosen the wrong venues to frequent mm -hmm. going out to nightclubs was a no-no um and just going out with a network that you knew so fame to me is it's a real curious beast it's an absolute fascinating case study in human development some people want to love you more some people want to hate you more most people most people don't know how to how to communicate with fame um and i get it it's um it's almost like a false economy um but um it's um it's certainly certainly a fascinating case starts case study um yeah for, that's for sure jeez that's did they, did they ever say why they did that or just because just you're on TV? Nah, look, they were up and gone. Um, you can only imagine, um, yeah, you can only imagine it was um, 
Oh, look at that bloke from home and away. Um, he's having a crack. He's sticking his head up over the parapet. Let's uh, let's knock it off. I would imagine, but yeah. but as I said, that's that's the ugly side of fame um, and um, just a reality. Yeah. Wow. So I, I said I'd I said I'd share everything with you, warts and all. So that's um. No, it's great. Yeah, yeah. That's some context. Wow. Um, we've spoken about my next question, so we'll move over to Ken's with the uh, guest appearances on other shows. Yep. Um, you've made a lot of guest appearances in shows such as Brother Tom, my, my brother Tom, All Saints, Blue Healers, MDA, City Homicide, Offspring, Rush, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, Fat Tony and Co, Party Tricks and Informer 3838. Can you tell us about that? and what it was like guesting compared to being a series regular in a show? Yeah, for sure. That's a really good question. Um, I was blessed, lucky, that all my early roles were lead roles. Um, it's just the way it worked out, or series regulars. So, and I knew the responsibility that carried. Um, so when I left home and away, travelled for a couple of years, tried to get back into the industry. Um, when I first got my break at 15, the competition was about that big. And then at 25, you know, you're probably in your peak competitive period. Um, I struggled to get work. Um, I wasn't dedicating. I wasn't anywhere near as obsessed about it. And, you know, that young kid driving his push bike, riding his push bike I didn't have anywhere near the obsession and to be successful in anything in life you need to be obsessed I was kind of going about it half assed waiting for the phone to ring and you can't wait for the phone to ring in that industry um, you need to knock doors down so it was time for me to get when the family came along a secure job so I did um, I did start getting more secure jobs because I had a responsibility of raising a family and I, but I still kept my agent. So I wasn't auditioning a lot, but I was being offered roles um, in TV shows like those shows that you mentioned. Some I had, some I had to test for, some I was being offered. They were small roles. They weren't particularly challenging roles, but it was great to be on the set. And it was really interesting from the, that perspective of being a guestie, like the main cast and crew ate first and then you'd go in and eat. There's kind of like a, a hierarchy there. Um, it's a real collaboration, but it was, I was almost, almost felt like I was looking on the outside in um, and then I just had to turn up and, and be on the job um, for, um, for my part. I was cognizant looking around at all the relationships that the leading cast have with the crew. And it really resem um, resonated with me because I, I understood it because, you know, I, I'd had all those leads before. Um, so you yeah, really had to turn it on. You had to come in, turn it on and turn it off real quick. And I was able to do that because of the training from home and away. When you're on a TV set for 40 hours a week, it really gives you a good grounding in how to turn it on and off quickly. It gives you that real comfortability factor um, in front of the camera. I remember Pamela Rabe, an interview Pamela Rabe did, who was in Wentworth. Um, I auditioned for that a couple of times. We can talk about that oh. later. I think that's a question. Um, I remember Pamela saying that what Wentworth did was it gave her that comfortability in front of the camera. And that was one of the good takeaways she had from that. So working on, um, working on those shows as guesties was great. And I'd know most of the cast and crew anyway, so it was like slipping on some comfy slippers. So working on Offspring, I remember Asha said she got the, Asha Ketty got the call seat, sheet the night before. She saw my name on it and she said she had a cry. She was excited to be working with me. And so we worked with each other for a day and a half and it was awesome. Um, and working on Rush with Roger Corsa. Yeah. Um, Les Hill and I had a production company and we made a few commercials, but I had to, just, had to dissolve that when I moved down to Melbourne because um, I started my family in Melbourne. That's when I relocated from Sydney. And Rog um, was in one of the commercials that Les Hill and I made 
um, running the production company. So it's a very small industry. Um, so when you get to work on guest roles, it's almost like it's almost like coming home to a degree because there's so many familiar faces. Um, but I loved it. it. Those guest roles gave me gave me that creative fulfilment I needed um, when I was working in my day jobs. It was a good little circuit breaker for me. Yeah. Did you find it hard being in a guest role, just coming out of you know a five year role with Home and Away, being the main guy, and then a guest? Did you sort of have that itch you wanted to get have a main role on the show, or you were happy just being the guest? Oh, no, no, no. I'd always wanted to get back into the industry and I was I was hoping and praying that a brilliant opportunity would come my way, but you've really got to hunt down opportunity. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, it was inspiring, absolutely. I'd be on the set and I'd just be chanting at the bit, you know, um, loving doing what I'm doing and liaising with the leads. I was probably a bit of a pain in the ass. actually. I was probably <laughs> hanging around where I shouldn't have been. Righto, mate, you've done your bit now. Piss off. Um <laughs> But um, no, it was um, it was inspiring, that's for sure. And I always knew that I was going to. Um, I had some unfinished business in the industry on a full time capacity, and that was always going to be when my kids were educated, of which they are now. So there's a few things on the go that we can chat about. Yeah. Okay. Um, my next question was about neighbours, which we have spoken about, and uh, the brilliant Ian Smith, who was also on Prisoner. So we'll move to uh, Ken's question. Yes, you, um, you, play, uh, you can you tell us about a, a small punch in a little town where you played Mike, but you were also the producer as well. How did the show come about? Yeah, okay. So this is, um, this is a good segue into what we were just talking about uh, in terms of um, opportunity not knocking. So now that the kids are through school, a mate of mine, Luke Robson, who is the brains trust of a small punch in a little town. He's the writer, director, producer, editor, DOP. Um, uh, a brilliant man, very creative, um, clever man. He wrote this feature film, A Small Punch in a Little Town, and I came on board as one of five producers. Um, so we shot the film uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, very small budget. We all put in a few grand each and we shot it down in Gippsland in a town called Locksport. Everyone worked for free. We used some amazing drone footage and the film was cut together and it's doing the, um, the film festival circuit and it's been quite successful in the United States. It's, um, it's won a, quite a few gongs on the film festival circuit. So we're now looking at trying to get some acquisition or distribution rights for it. This is a really good example of creating your own opportunity in the unfinished business that I talked about. Um, um, all of us have got a thirst to um, work in the industry and one of the ways to do it is obviously create your own work. So uh, if it gets uh, picked up, distributed, look, that'd be great. But what it's done is it's, um, it's really... Um, really just driven more passion to create more work. So I've written another feature film um, called um, Last Chance. And um, it's about a group of gambling addicts from GA who push a billy cart from Sydney to Where's Rock to raise money for a dying child. And in the process, they pull off one of the greatest gambling stings of all time. So I'm looking at... Um, I'm polishing the script now and then I'll be looking for funding um, and hopefully that'll be my next feature film. So That's we're heavily invested. Cool. Like yeah, like. we're, yeah, look, we're very heavily invested in, um, in generating our own work now. And, um, you know, that, that passion, that obsession that I talked about still there. So um, I've auditioned for a lot of stuff lately um, you know, I tested for three times for Wentworth without luck. Um, uh, what a wonderful production that is. Um, and just brilliant casting. Um, Nathan Lloyd from Nathan Lloyd Casting is a genius. He got it so right. Um, yeah, really great production. Um, so, you know, I've tested for a lot of things. Um, some I've got, some I haven't. But 
what is in my control is my ability to be able to generate work. So that's what I did. That's what we did with a small punch in a little town and other projects that we've got coming up. Do you think that's easier now because of all the platforms and YouTube and Netflix and everything that, you know, back in the eighties or nineties, you could never do something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Now you can create your own opportunities. Yes, I think it's easier. And I also think it's diminishing fame. And so it's easier because when I was a kid and I wanted to watch something, you'd have to go to the movies or pick one of the five TV stations. Now everyone's got a TV station in their back pocket. Yeah. My daughter makes amazing content. My daughter's an, an influencer and we'll, we can talk about um, her later, my oldest daughter. And um, um, yeah, everyone's got a television state, the station in their back pocket. So it is it's so much easier and it's also changed the landscape of, um, I guess, you know, distribution. And, um, you know, now all the movie stars are, um, are really interested in TV as their main genre. I remember, I'll tell you this story, when I was on Home and Away, I rocked up to Mel Gibson's The Hamlet. We used to get a lot of free stuff, the flashy stuff. So the premiere of that. And there are a couple of film actors. They're actually pretty famous now. Um one of the photographers said, come on, Matt, get in a photo with these actors. And they looked at me and said, no, 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 he's a TV actor. We don't have photos with TV actors. Oh. And, the, and the, the irony is that, um, that it's come full circle. And now TV is really where most of the film actors, because of the commercial viability of streaming and all that sort of stuff, um, yeah, most of the heavyweights are really moving to TV. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a massive transformation, hasn't it? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, my daughter watches this channel on YouTube, this, this dad and his daughter, they do all this crazy stuff. And the channel's got 9 million subscribers. And every video they put up each week will get over 4 to 5 million views within a few days. And, and it's just like some of the, the TV networks don't even get those views now. I mean, <laughs> the ratings. And no, and yeah, I mean, I'm seeing it firsthand with my daughter, who's an influencer. I mean, she gets sent products. People are advertising now through these influences and through these platforms. My daughter gets sent products all the time, um, you know, and paid quite handsomely to endorse some of them. So obviously it's just changed the whole marketing landscape, hasn't it? And yeah. it's made it so much easier for creatives to not only be creative, but to have creative control. So, yeah, yeah it's fascinating. It's awesome. It was that time right. where if you wanted to be an actor, you had, a, you had to have an agent. And to have an agent, you needed to act. So no one could get in. <laughs> yep. Uh, it was a catch catch 22. And I, I was able to break that door down through being so lucky with, you know, the ABC breaking up. Yeah. And I recognise that. I recognise that. But for many, yeah, that catch 22 was, it was just so hard to break through. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, just talking on uh, Prisoner for a minute. That's how we connected through the uh, Talking Prisoner Facebook page. So were you a fan of uh, Prisoner back in its day? You used to watch it. Well, I was, yeah, absolutely. You know, the eight-year-old boy driving his pushy to um, yes. Channel Ten. Um, Prisoner was being filmed then. I remember seeing Elsbeth Ballantyne coming out of the studios, and it was like, oh man, you know, it was like I've just seen the most famous person in the world. So, um, um, and I used to play soccer for Nana Wadding, and a couple of the actors would be in the club rooms, you know, and I was just besotted. Um, but my favourite, I think, was Lizzie Birdsworth. I just, I've always wanted to be, I've always wanted to be a character actor, and that character. I mean, she was just, she was just so beautiful playing that character, Florence. And um, um, yeah, I just, um, yeah, she was, she would have had to have been my favourite. And also like um, the freak. I remember working with Maggie on Home and Away. She, I was yes. genuinely starstruck. She. She filmed on Home and Away for a couple of weeks and, um, uh, yeah, I was just genuinely starstruck because she was such a rich part of my childhood. And obviously, B. Smith, so Val. Val, um, yes. I remember running into these guys, and you know, these, these actors, and uh, because they played such an important part of my life um, when I was younger, yeah, I just had so much respect for them. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, now, we spoke about Wentworth, which was Ken's question. Now, just before we get into Home and Away, I just want to talk about in 2021, the project on Channel 10 
had a headline about you and it was called A Powerful Example of a Parent Doing It Right. I've actually seen the clip myself. So if you don't mind, we'd like to talk about your daughter, Grace, just for a moment before we get stuck in the home in a way. So can you tell us a story about Grace and, and for the fans? Yeah, sure can. So I've got two amazing daughters, Maddie and Grace. And my oldest daughter came to us at the age of 12. She actually um, came to her stepmom, Miles, my wife, and said that um, she had a secret. And Marlene, my wife, said, would you, do you want to write it down? Um, would you feel more comfortable doing that? And so she wrote it down and she said she thinks she was trans. So that started a beautiful journey. She's now my 21-year-old daughter, Grace. She's transitioned fully and she's now an advocate supporting trans, brave trans adolescents. And I'm part of a, a global group called Dragon Dads on Facebook, which is dads of courageous, diverse kids. So we share our stories and we provide support for each other. So um, Grace's journey has been beautiful. Her biggest fans are Sister Maddie. Her sister Maddie's just been awesome. You know, Maddie said uh, when she found out, oh, beauty, I've now got a, a sister. <laughs> so the whole journey, uh, the whole of Grace's journey and our journey, because it's, um, you know, it's a journey that the whole family and extended family and friends undertake has been really cool. Grace has been so courageous. You know, I, I often say I've had a front row seat to the most courageous thing I've seen. I used to equate courage um, to, um, uh, you know, acts of bravery on the sporting field, like Jonathan Brown running back into a pack to take a mark or Mick Doohan 300 Ks around a racetrack. Until I saw my wife battle cancer and she's survived and she's now in remission. It's, I mean, and watching Grace transition, you know, it just redefines my, um, my definition of courage, I suppose. So it's been a beautiful journey. And she's now living the best version of herself. Yep. She does a lot of work on social media. She's influencers and advocates. Um, and she's just moved into a unit in town. So she's having a great time. And all, all you want really as a parent is for your kids to be happy and safe. Um, and both of my daughters are, you know, are happy, they're safe, and they're being the best versions of themselves. So um, from that perspective, I probably rate parenting um, as my greatest achievement, but I'd really, you know, I mean, with the little caveat that, um, my wife's done most of the hard work, right? Because I'm a bit of a village idiot. So she's uh, without my wife. Without my wife, I don't think it would have run anywhere near as smoothly. So um, yeah, no, family's important, and um, yeah, Grace's journey has been really cool. One th one thing that stuck out at me with that interview was um, Grace mentioned that if she was forced to go through puberty at twelve or thirteen or whenever it was, she she probably wouldn't be here. So is that yeah. is that a common? I'm not fully educated in all of this, so excuse me if I'm coming off the wrong way, but is that a common thing in for kids, you know, that age that do want to come out, they, they do think about suicide and things like that? Yeah, it is. And no dramas about apologising. I mean, Grace, <clears throat> Grace, with her advocacy, she gets asked a lot of questions. Um, and I said to Grace, aren't you offended by some of these questions? And Grace said, we can't be offended by them, Dad. We need to take the higher ground and we've got to educate. And people are only asking these questions because, um, and it's great that they're asking the questions because they want to be educated. And we only know a bit more about it because we've lived and breathed it. So, yeah, no, it's a really good question. And sadly, um, sadly amongst um, trans adolescents, I mean, we've got a, a really high youth suicide rate in this country as it is. And, you know, it's... Um, if anyone's impacted, please reach out to Lifeline. I mean, it's um, please do that. It's um, it's a bloody tragedy. But trans adolescents are thirty six times more likely to self harm. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's it's massive, mate. Um, boys, and it's um, there's a distinct correlation between lack of support and self harm. So I, me and my wife, we weren't we weren't going to 
we weren't going to let lack of support be one of the reasons. Um, but I remember we were driving to the Royal Children's Hospital um, and I did say to Grace, what if we can't get this done? And she said, well, why would I want to live a lie, Dad? Why would I want to live as someone I'm not? So that's the sort of courage I'm talking about. She was, um, she knew what she wanted. Um, she knew how to get there, but she knew she needed support to get there. So, um, yeah, sadly, sadly, these brave adolescents, they need a really safe space to be able to work out who they are. Because we've got the luxury of that. You know, most of us, we kind of know who we are, where we fit in, what we do when we're young. But these kids don't. They don't need that added layer of crap on top of it um, whilst they're working out who they are. What they need is support. And I think it's going to be their generation that really nails it. Um, uh, but, yeah, I'm just super proud of her. Um, I'm super proud of how she stepped up and wanting to make the pathways a lot easier for other kids. It's been awesome. That's amazing. Amazing job for you too, mate. I, I really take, you know, it's... Thanks, mate. ...support you're given. Um, has she seen you on Home and Away? Has she watched any episodes? <laughs> yeah. Her and Maddie have seen them. Um, things pop up on YouTube. You know, I'm, I mean, occasionally... Well, Maddie was in a small punch in a little town, so I got to... Um, Maddie and I got to act together and Maddie's a brilliant actress. She's got more talent than I ever had. Um, and she's a great singer, great with accents. So Maddie's um, with my agency and I think she's um, the world's her oyster if she wants it in that caper. So she's looked at a bit more stuff, but um, oh, the kids just love it. They take the piss out of the mullet. You know how I had the mullet <laughs> back then and, um, all that sort of stuff. So um, they're, they're just normal kids, you know, like um, um, having a good old laugh at what dad used to do. But I think, I think it'll be, um, it'll be good nostalgia for them. You know, when I'm in my rocking chair and beyond, I think they'll be able to look back at that sort of stuff. And, and they got some pretty good footage of their old man when he was in his prime. I think you're even rocking some speedos back in the, the home and away days, weren't you on the, on the beach? <laughs> Standard, um, standard uh, home and away commissioned apparel, mate. Yeah, um, yeah. The boys had to be, um, the boys had to be in speedos. Um, and I think there's a couple of guys on. The, my wife watches the show a lot now, and um, um, uh, and I think there's a couple of boys that are really ripped on the show at the moment. But yep, yeah, when you sign up to work on home and away, you've got to make sure you're in good nick because you will be in speedos most of the time, or you might be walking into the Bayside Diner with your shirt off. Yeah. Um, I noticed there was a fan question there about, was that my choice? And <laughs> no, no. First, first, day, first day I rocked up on the OB, I said, where's my costume? Where's, what am I wearing? There it was. Just these little budgie smugglers on a coat hanger. There you go, Matt. Slip into those. Yeah, it's all part of it, mate. But luckily, it was at Palm Beach, unlike Holiday Island, Ken, that used to film in Nunawadding, that used to be about five degrees. So um, at least we got some warm weather to shoot um, Home and Away in, thank God. Ken's thank got a God. funny story about Holiday Island. The, what, oh, what they used to put tell in us, mate. <laughs> I've got a lot of stories about Holiday Island, but um, the ice in the mouth to cut down their breath was one of the things. Um, going back to um, Home and Away, um, you appeared in 518 episodes, Whoa. not all in Budgie Smugglers, uh, between episodes 338 and 1413, uh, and that was time period was 1989 to 1994, and returned for a stint in 99 between episodes 2656 and 2702. How did you get the part of Adam Cameron and had you auditioned uh, for any other parts before? Yeah, good question. Um, so Home and Away, I think I mentioned um, when I was working on Neighbours, the associate producer came up. So I was kind of headhunted for the part in Home and Away. I hadn't auditioned for the show before then. So that initial stint when I was 19 was the first time I'd auditioned for the show. And I was just really lucky, um, you know, that the, um, that the producer, um, 
yeah, had the faith in me because um, I was up against some pretty stiff competition. But he had some faith in me. And, um, yeah, I signed a three-year contract and I think I ended up working for close to five years. Yep. And then the second, the second stint I came back, and this is how this industry works, I saw – Cherie Black, the amazing production manager. She's just the, like everyone's mum on the show. You talk to Kate Ritchie, you talk to anyone on the show. We just love this lady. She saw me out one night and she said, what are you doing, Matt Stevenson? Do you want to come back on the show? And I said, I'd love to. So um, my agent got a call the next day and then um, I came back on the show. But the writers, they wrote some cheesy Bonzerberger storyline and when they had so much gold, they could have written a really good storyline about um, young Ryan Clark, who was Sam, who was Bobby's son, was working on the show then. They could have written some real gold about reconnecting with him um, and dealing with the Bobby storyline, the, the trauma aftermath. But the freelance writers, I think, at the time weren't aware of that. So they wrote this cheesy Bonzerberger storyline where I came back as this franchise mogul um and i remember john holmes as the executive producer um when he found out that the story had already been written he was a bit put out of place about it so he apologized he said sorry matt and that's how i got that role on all saints he said look sorry we did this storyline it could have been so much richer so as my token of uh, apology and um, appreciation have a guest role on all saints so that was quite interesting. So, um, and that was beautiful. But yeah, the, the, that was a good gig on all saints. But that's um, that's the genesis of my home and away employment. Yeah. And did you have a character breakdown of Adam before um before you took when you auditioned for the part? You know what he was going to be. The, the series producer told me that he was employing Danny Minogue at the same time, and they wanted me and Danny to be the new Kylie and Jason. Ah. Um, that was the strategy um, but things didn't work out that way and they changed tax they they um, sunk my yacht uh, and then they got me doing some more comic timing stuff um, I think Danny may have worked on the show for about 18 months um, but um, and she, she was a wonderful wonderful lady um, so um yeah, that's what I was originally told, but they changed tack pretty quickly with that. Um, and then I think my character, I think my character had a relationship with most of the girls on the show, um, as you tend to do, you know. Um, and then I think he might have been solo for quite a while. So I don't know, there's a long time, five years, it's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, although it only started the year before you joined, did you watch Home and Away before you got the part? Yeah, I did. Loved it. Um, I was obsessed. So when I got the job, it was my dream, dream role. I think either myself or Emily Simons were the first full-time actor employed into the show after it started. So I joined the show 18 months after it started. And Em, and em or I, Em is still working on the show as Marilyn. Um, one of us, but um, the reason why I raise that is um, anyone that's worked on Home and Away because it's been going for 30 odd years since it started owes a huge debt of gratitude to those original cast yeah. and crew who worked on the show because they really consolidated its existence. So people like Ray Ma, who's still on it, Judy Nunn, Norman Coburn, Vanessa, Roger, Nikki, Adam Willits, Sharon Hodgson, Craig Thompson, Peter Vroom, I could go on and on. These guys created something pretty special. The show's moved away from that kind of foster care yeah. format now, but um, um, when I joined the show, I had watched it and I was in awe coming into the show. Absolutely. Justine Clark, another one to mention. Alex Paps, who I replaced. Um, Bruce Venables. So, yeah, it's um, I love the show and I owe a huge, great adage, a huge debt of gratitude to um, the original cast and crew. Yeah, absolutely. Stellar cast, you just said then too. I remember them all. Uh, they were great. Yeah, it was brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. 
Um, did you know anyone going on the show when you joined? Did you had you worked with anyone prior to, to going? I knew, I knew Alex because we had the same agent, yep. but we crossed we crossed paths. Um, and I hadn't worked. No, I hadn't worked with any of the other actors. Matt Day, I think, won the role to come up and work on a country practice. Yeah. The same time that I won my role on Home and Away, and Maddie and I had done the audition circuit together in Melbourne. We had auditioned a lot in Melbourne for a lot of stuff. Um, so he, yeah, he he came up to work on a country practice. So, but no one on Home and Away. Yeah. Adam's parents were already dead by the time he turned up in Summer Bay. How did you feel about that and the fact we wouldn't be introduced to any relatives of Adam? Well, never say never in the soap opera, as you know, Ken, because strange <laughs> things can happen. I think Bobby Bobby came back as a ghost or, or yes. Elsa came back. <laughs> Someone came back as a ghost. Or a swim. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I didn't give that a thought, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, but, um, you know, I thought, you know, you work so fast, as you guys know, you shoot the equivalent of a feature film every week. So the writers are working just as frenetically. So um, frenetically, so um, anything's possible. Um, if they wanted to, long lost relatives could have, come out of a mire somewhere, but certainly, yep, having dead parents, that's pretty final in terms of <laughs> anywhere to go with cast, with, with, with um, storyline potentials, that's for sure. I think it added to, um, I think they set that up because it added to his loner persona yeah. that, he, that he had, yeah. Definitely. Um, now, I hope you're okay with the next question, talking about Dita Brummer, who played Shane Parrish, who was amazing on Home and Away, and, you know, sadly we lost him last year, um, and you were quite closely with him on Home and Away. What was it like working with him? Yeah, just a beautiful bloke, um, beautiful bloke inside and out. Um, he was like a little brother to me, so I was four or five years older than him, um, and it was like a school back then. It was like, you know, these, these, these were young kids. Yeah. So on his first day, I told him because he was the new cast member, he would have to go to the Channel 7 canteen and get all our lunches. Like we'd give him the orders. And he goes, oh, fair nick. And I said, yeah, buddy, you got to do that. So I had him going for about a week <laughs> until he twigged. And then um, he gave me the biggest nipple cripple. He was really renowned for his nipple cripples. No one was safe. I said, what'd you do that for, mate? And he said, you've been stooging me. So we had a good kind of older brother, younger brother, piss take relationship um, uh, whilst we were on the show. Um, yeah, but look, um, the news of his death was just a bloody tragedy. I remember hearing it and someone on Messenger who I don't talk to a lot posted a message saying, sorry to hear about your mate Dieter. And I'm sitting on the couch next to my wife and I said, I showed her. I said, look at this. And I go, no, 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 he's, he's, he's got to be wrong. And um, sure enough, um, yep, the news came through. And look, as tragic as it was, and it still is tragic, and I feel for Dawn, his mum, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just... I do a lot of work in the mental health space for, for men, and we can tap into that uh, a bit later, but... Um, what I saw on Facebook on Messenger was a couple of the younger actors who worked on the show who were Deet's age, um, just reaching out, trying to process the grief. So I, I created this chat group on Messenger just so that we could check in with each other and make sense of this tragedy. And um, two days later, there's about 100 of us on this chat group, past cast and crew, and we're all just... We're all just, you know, working out a way um, to deal with it. And we thought that the one of the things we needed to do was we needed to reconnect. So I facilitated a Zoom conversation with everyone across three um, continents. Um, and Dita's mum and Dita's siblings came along. And whilst I can't share, you know, what we talked about um, during that three hours, it was just such a beautiful, beautiful tribute for Deet. So, um, yeah, look, we all miss him. 
dearly. Um, we just absolutely miss him. Um, and, uh, you know, my thoughts are with his, with his mum, Dawn, and, um, and, his, um, and his family. One thing we did, one of the many, I guess, legacies out of Deet's death from, from his home and away family's perspective is myself and Jason Franklin, uh, previous producer, and Bruce Roberts, who played Dieter's brother, who reads a lot of news for Win TV now, uh, we set up a Home and Away alumni, which is a, um, a Facebook page for all past cast and crew to reconnect. And we've got a lot of things that we're, um, we're looking at doing. Um, and with a view, um, we, we've set these platforms up uh, twofold, one to reconnect and uh, secondly to provide support as a support network. Um, and we think that those legacies are some really healthy ways in which we can honour deep because I can tell you, he was loved, man. He was loved by, um, by so many people. He would be right at home talking to you about philosophy or he could talk to a plasterer in the pub about how to pin plasterboards or a, how to screed off concrete to a concreter. Um, yeah, he was a special bloke, special bloke. I uh, loved him, still love him, but um, yeah. Just a tragedy. Such a talented actor. I mean, I remember watching him recently in one of the, the one of the recent underbellies. He played a uh, dodgy detective, and he's just brilliant. Just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he he never he never bought into the fame game. He never subscribed to it, and by default, I don't think he ever realised how um, how talented he was because he was. He was one of the best looking roosters I've ever seen and, um, and such a talented guy. And um, really, I mean, at the height of, at the height of his career, um, yeah, he certainly, um, he certainly had the world at his feet. There's no doubt about it. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, look, the fans, the fans deserve a little insight because um, I've told you how fond of the fans I I was well. Dita was, Dita was equally as fond. So, whilst you know, whilst there's some things that are that are deeply personal. I mean, you know, I cert certainly don't mind sharing an insight into what he meant to us as a home and away family because he was um, he was absolutely loved. Definitely. Now, a Adam Cameron was a nice enough guy, but he did get mixed up in some scams. Would you say he was easily led or more of an, an initiator? <laughs> um, they based his character off the Artful Dodger or there was a, a show in the UK, was it called The Minder? Well, there, was, um, there was a bloke, I think, in The Minder who was a scammer. And <clears throat> they, they wanted to turn my character into a bit of a comic relief, a bit of a scammer. So... Um, which was good because I got to work on my comic timing um, a lot. But yeah, some of the hairbrain, hairbrain, hairbrain schemes were um, pushed the boundaries. There was one where I think he set up, um, he said that there was a bunyip, this prehistoric animal running around Yabby Creek in Summer Bay, this bunyip. So he made a, made a, lot, of, a lot of bunyip merchandise to sell to the punters. Um, a couple of the, the storylines beggared belief. I think... Um, I think he was a bit of a goose um, uh, and he had uh, some, certainly some misgivings. Um, some of the storylines I would look at and I'd cringe, I'd go, oh, shit, how am I going to pull these off? Um, but um, yeah, some of the stuff was kind of lighthearted, um, but I, I must admit, I did shake my head at a couple of the storylines. Yeah. Um, my next question was about Les Hill, who we've uh, who we've spoken about. So we'll move over to Ken's next one. Yeah, Adam had a brief romance with Carly Morris, and then a relationship with Emma Jackson. What are your memories of working with Sharon Hodgson and Danny Minogue? Yep, both beautiful ladies. I will go back to Les and say Les, Les and I are probably the closest out of anyone on that show. Okay. Les Hill. Um, yeah, we started a production company together. We travelled to England a lot. Uh, I love Les. Les is a very talented actor. 
and he's doing a lot of great things in front and behind the camera. So I love Les. Um, Hilly is a good man. Um, and he's an amazing Sharon, actor. He's done some great things. Oh, mate, he's brilliant. He's yeah. he's a talented guy, and um, he's uh, yeah, he deserves uh, all the success in the world because the guys um, the guys are an extremely talented bloke. You know what really yeah, loved me with Les was um, the part he played in the first the first underbelly. He played uh, Jason Jason Moran. Moran. Yeah, and far out, he just nailed it. Like he's mannerisms he must have really you know i hope to get speak to him one day to talk to him about that but he must have really studied that jason moran to to get it so yeah. right <clears throat> yeah my oh, he's he's a very talented guy we've made a lot of short films and um commercials together with um yeah we've worked closely he's um he's a really good buddy of mine um and extremely talented very talented uh he should be doing a lot more um and he will um Sharon Hodgson, she's I love this lady. She, she's one of the most beautiful people in the world and what a talented actor, man. You know, I mentioned I wasn't trained and I used to just watch people when I, when I, when I worked on Home and Away. So when I worked on Neighbours, I had a bit of time with my scripts because, you know, I only had three months at a time so I could really invest a lot in. But when I was in Home and Away, it was the bump and grind of... The first time you read your scripts were when you were rehearsing them. So, you know, I remember watching Sharon um, and she was just so seamless, so effortless, just just such a brilliant performer. And um, if she's not the nicest person in the world, she's in the conversation, you know, she's just a beautiful person. Um, so I learned a lot working with Sharon. Um, Yep, I think, yeah, we played boyfriend and girlfriend for a heartbeat there. And then I think her character might have got married to Julian McMahon's character, if yeah. I remember. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yep, beautiful, beautiful person. And Danny, um, yes, uh, absolutely stunning lady. Um, just so generous with her time. Um, my father passed away when I was working on Home and Away. Um when I was a 20 year old and we were filming this big scene, um, it was a full cast scene when I got the news. And that was obviously a very traumatic time for me. And Danny um, was just so beautiful um, after the event um, with her support. Um, so it's been, oh, and I had a massive crush on her. I, I was starstruck because I used to love the young talent time, right? So um, yeah. Um, yeah, I must admit I was, kind of starstruck working with her um, initially. Um, and then I found out how, you know, how beautiful she was. And, um, yep, it's been good um, watching her career. She's, um, she's a super, super talent and um, a beautiful lady. Now, uh, speaking of beautiful ladies, this question is asked by fans, our producer, Jan, uh, a lot of people, even people actually private message, you go, make sure you ask him about Bobby. So you you accidentally killed off one of the beloved characters, Bobby. Bobby. I need a tissue. Yeah. <laughs> you got me welling up. It's too soon. Yeah. It's too soon. <laughs> uh, so what was it like filming that storyline? Did you cop a bit of grief back in the day in the public? Yeah, I got, yeah, that was the dead huntsman in the envelope fan mail thing. And I got hit over the head. <laughs> By an old lady with her umbrella. She was about 80. Um, you killed Bobby. I'll never talk to you again. Um, so, um, yeah, I did cop a lot of grief over that. I killed Bobby and never worked again. That's my um, that's my favourite log line, you see. So, um, uh, yeah, look, it was a Nikki. I love, now, speaking of beautiful people, Nicole Bell. Wow. Yeah. Um, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. She fell in love when she worked on the show with a wonderful bloke and they are still madly in love and oh, wow. they live in, live in New South Wales and her life became that life. And um, I've got no doubt that um, had she have wanted to pursue acting, that she would be um, enormously successful. But yeah. she... Um, she chose uh, a path um, and, um, you know, she's just an amazing lady. Um, when she met her now husband, he was living in Melbourne and I was from Melbourne. So 
we used to do midnight drives down to Melbourne with Nikki, her mum, me. So we'd wrap in the studio on Friday. We'd drive all Friday night so we could spend some time down in Melbourne on Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'd drive back up and film on Monday. So we used to do that often. So you can imagine sitting in a car for eight, nine, ten hours. We used to um, have a lot of good conversations together. But filming that stuff... I got to really uh, reconnect with my, I guess, acting chops in terms of um, dramatic stuff. Because there was a couple of heavy emotional scenes that required, you know, um, uh, you know, heavy emotion. Um, so, and it was a good change from those rat baggy kind of storylines that Adam was doing. Um, I, I remember I went to the producer and said, I need a story with a bit of meat. And Nikki was departing the show and they thought, well, ah. let's come up with his storyline. So, um, yeah, it was good. It was good. It was, um, it's obviously one that I'm re remembered most for. And I think when Channel 7 trundle out, you know, Home and Away's most amazing moments, it always seems to feature, which is, um, which is a good thing. I mean, it's in, and certainly the fan reaction um, in the street after her death, yeah, it was um, it was pretty passionate. You're saying now, like you're, you're a wonderful producer, and a, a lot of fans have sent you messages. Yes, I was um, I was not well liked for an extended <laughs> period of time there. Um, but then I saved Sam in a house fire, and all is yeah. redeemed. <laughs> and what an amazing <laughs> character development for her character, though, coming in as a a troubled kid and a rat bag and then going on to owning the diner with uh, Judy Nunn and getting married. And it was, it was brilliant. Really good. I talk about, I talk about actors and cast who have worked on the show past the original cast, owing them a huge debt of gratitude. Well, Nicole was one of those drivers. I mean, Nicole, I don't think we'd seen a leading character in a soap of that genre like Nicole before yeah. just so gritty and gutsy um and uh yeah I, I we've got a lot to be thankful for for Nikki and her role on that show yeah absolutely definitely and then I killed her yeah <laughs> now we've just um mentioned the, the um saving of uh, Sam from a fire in his house um so perhaps we yeah. can just go on to the next one so what what did you enjoy most about playing adam what was your uh favorite thing about adam look i love the beach scenes the location it was awesome you would film a beach scene in the morning and then you might have the afternoon off um so myself and greg benson would you know um head out into the water you know catch a couple of crayfish didn't happen often but you know I just remember these things um being the most memorable so probably working on the show but character specific um was getting to work on my comic timing um some of the fun stuff that uh, we got to do um I remember my character caught a great white shark once um because he killed Rory um one of my mates who went on to direct that film Two Hands Gregor Jordan um, so here I am catching this massive shark, you know, in Summer Bay with um, Roger Oakley behind me, holding me. And um, I remember the props guys went to the fish markets to get a fish, uh, a shark, and this shark was nowhere near as big as what we needed. So they had to they had to knock up this paper mache shark with a props guy at the fin, just sort of rocking it back and forward, so it looked like it was alive. You know? We, we 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 were filming the equivalent of a movie a week so there was compromises everywhere but i think pound for pound with all the compromises it's bloody good quality when you take that into account that that's yeah. how much you're churning out yeah wow. i just loved it all i loved it all yeah who did you enjoy mostly uh, enjoy doing scenes with um emily simons plays marilyn lovely lady um and our characters worked together closely a lot. And um, again, another super talented lady. Um, and we just connected. Um, yep, I found uh, working with her really seamless. So 
I must admit, and Craig Thompson, who played uh, Martin, and yes. Peter Vroom, who played Lance. Oh, those guys. <laughs> uh, you've got to interview these guys. They are just, yeah. they are just good men. And we had a great time together. Yep, it was awesome. Oh, great. His first storyline, he won Tats Lotto and uh, put this big motorhome in the caravan park. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, fond memories. I'm smiling. It's genuine, genuine happiness just thinking of those guys. Yeah. Good blokes. Um, now, I'm just keeping on the time. We might move to the fan questions just so we don't run out of time. But before we do, um, we spoke to Deborah Lawrence in episode 26 of talking prisoner because she was on prisoner um, yep. and we asked her this question also would she go back to home and away and she said no definitely not because she thinks the show has changed dramatically to what it was when she was on it what are you, would you go back now she's just got too much money um <laughs> so she's working on harry potter now i think yeah, yes. you could, well, yeah. Deborah Lawrence and Dennis Cord, um, Deb and Dennis, love them to bits. Amazing lady. She's just such a beautiful soul. Um, um, and they're great, um, those two together. Um, yeah. yeah, I can understand I can understand exactly where she's coming from. Um, I, on the other hand, would go back. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, uh, there's, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, I've got... Um, I've got a lot of um, stuff that I want to do in the industry and certainly going back to um, Home and Away would be one of them without doubt, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So Lucy Adario, the series producer, if you're watching this, <laughs> checks in the mail. <laughs> she's, a, um, she's a lovely lady too. Yeah. Uh, fan questions, Ken, first one? Yeah, the first one is from Luke Tayapi. Tayapa. I remember you on Home and Away, which you were great as Adam, and you did the role very well. I'd like to ask about the boat accident scene, which Bobby dies. That is, did you do your stunts or was there a double? Thanks, Luke. Um, and good question, mate. I hope you're well. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I was driving the boat at the time for most of it, but they had an explosion when it went over the log. And so I think they'd set an, ex an explosive in, um, in the back of the boat. So they had to have stunties in the boat for that. Um, so for that particular part of it, no, no, that there was a stunty. Yep. Awesome. Now, there's a bit of a, a comment and a question from Carl Buckle. Hi, Matt. Hope you are well. I didn't see your H&A return in 99 as I worked away from home then, no on demand then, but loved your character and I did feel sorry for you. You are quite misunderstood and definitely had a raw deal like me, I suppose, but jealous you went out with Carly. I used to fancy her just wondering who you were close with on Home and Away and do you keep in touch with anyone, which we sort of have touched on. I have been to Palm Beach and it's just like being in the show. They were filming a major scene there when I was there and most of the cast and crew were present and the ones I spoke to were brilliant. Special mentions to Kate Ritchie, Emily Perry and Jason Smith, Best Day in Australia, the Bring Back Adam Cameron campaign to Home and Away starts right here. I'm sure Al <laughs> would love to have him back. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. There's lots of stuff there. And, yep, the Bring Back Adam Cameron campaign, I love that one. Lucy Adario, the series producer, there you go. Hit her up. Um, yeah, look, it, the Home and Away was amazing. Sharon Hodgson, you mentioned Carly. Yep, I'm not surprised um, that you're in love with her because she's such a beautiful lady, um, uh, such a nice lady. Um, and... Um, yeah, Palm Beach. Palm Beach is um, is uh, not a bad office, is it? It's uh, beautiful, and I'm glad. I'm glad that you got to go there and to watch them film. They're all very accommodating. Kate Ritchie is absolutely awesome. Um, Kate's one of the nice. You know, I say everyone's nice, but they are. I mean, Kate's just um, a beautiful young lady. Um, 
just such a special person. Um, and in terms of the my return, I think you can find my return stuff if you're keen to watch it. Um, I think you can find it somewhere. It's floating around on the information yeah. highway somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, have a look. But bring back Adam Cameron, the campaign. I love that. Hashtag Straight to the top, it. dude. <laughs> Hashtag, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag Adam Cameron. There we go. So, yeah, there you go, Carl. Look it up on, uh, it should be on YouTube, I'm assuming. The uh, return. The next one's from a comment from Aaron Bond, uh, which says, very famous as Adam Cameron in Home and Away, a popular character, good guest to have. So yes. pat on the back for us. Uh, Thank you very much. I appreciate that. that. That makes this all the all the worthwhile doing. I mean, I get as much out of this, obviously, being able to reminisce. Um, uh, so I hope yeah, you guys are as well. So thank you. Really appreciate that. Heartfelt. Definitely. And also follow on from that. Leslie Hall said he was so cute in Home and Away, which is another... What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. Um, straight to the top of the class for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know what, what I can say about that. Just blush and say, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was, um, it was good. It was good uh, working on the show as a young person. Um, uh, really good way to make a living as a young person. A great way to spend your late teens and early 20s, that's for sure. And thank you. I appreciate the compliment. One thing I did want to ask you uh, before was you were talking about doing the publicity things when you're on Home and Away. Was that uh, the shopping centre appearances and all those type of things, which were quite big back then? Yeah. Yeah, look, it was insane. Um, <clears throat> so we worked pretty hard. Could be up to 18-hour days, Monday to Friday, um, depending on how many episodes you're involved in. And on the weekend, there was the publicity machine. So it was that would usually involve getting on a plane, um, staying for the weekend in a different state and, um, uh, you know, attending many, many publicity events, shopping centres, uh, family days, um, network engagements, um, win a barbecue with, you know, yeah. an actor. So there was, it was extremely demanding um, and, it did become suffocating uh, at times, just the sheer workload. But um, there are always those moments that I shared with you about being able to make someone's day that um, yeah. the kind of grounded you in amongst the in amongst the work rate. But it was it was it was um, it was a chaotic work schedule. There's no doubt about it. But that's what it's all about. Definitely. Aaron Hembrow says, um, what an amazing opportunity to interview a very talented actor. I'd like at this point to suggest that you, yeah. we don't write these questions. <laughs> these are real questions. I'd like to ask, outside of acting, what was the most exciting part of your life? And was this your proudest moment? Um, and he gives some examples, you know, getting married, overcoming something, children, etc. But what was your proudest moment? Yeah, okay, great. Look, great question, and thank you. I appreciate. I appreciate the compliment regarding um, my acting. Yeah, that's um, that means a lot to me. Sincerely, um, the proudest moment is my family. I think we touched on it. Um, you know, knowing that my girls, my daughters, um, are healthy, well adjusted, um, and feel secure in themselves, apart from the normal chaos that goes on. Um, and my marriage, because my wife's had a huge part in my life in regards to um, in regards to that. So um, yeah, um, you know, when I left home and away, you know, I was battling a couple of personal demons, and life wasn't all that good for me. There was an adjustment I had to make, and so my wife was was a huge level of support. Um, and um, I would say that my biggest my the the thing that I look on with most um, I guess accomplishment is certainly my family, no doubt by a mile. Yeah, fantastic. 
Um, Samantha in the UK said, what was it like working with Ray Ma? Good old Blame and hell, Cameron. <laughs> Blame and Cameron, what's he done this time? Um, <laughs> Ray's a good man. Ray is a very, very smart businessman. He's a clever, clever dude. Um, there's a reason why he's been on the show since its inception. Um, Ray played schoolboy um, rugby for Australia. <clears throat> um, very good sportsman and a very, very good actor. Check out Mail Order Bride when he was a young bloke, if you haven't seen that. He's, um, he's outstanding. And he was an awesome mentor on the show and probably still is to this day. Um, Ray's the cornerstone of that show. Um, and um, yeah, he's, um, he's a legend. Yeah. And I don't use that word lightly, but he's an absolute legend, that bloke. Sure is. And a good mate. And a good mate. Yeah. Now, this one's from David, who's either in Florida or David. Florida. His next name is Florida. <laughs> uh, he's in the USA. Do you miss being on home and away? I miss the process of regular work, absolutely. And I miss the people. Um, yeah, yeah. It was a huge part of my life, huge, but wonderful part of my life. And I, um, I absolutely miss, um, miss the routine of work because I'm a bit of a workhorse. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, we've spoken about it. I mean, I'm not shamelessly pitching up for it as an opportunity, yeah. but, yeah, I mean, if I, was, if I was to return to that show, I'm one of these people that would embrace that for sure. Amazing. Um, we touched on this one a little bit. Gloria from Queensland. You had your shirt off quite a lot in Home and Away. Was that your idea or the producers? <laughs> yeah. Not my idea, but I had to get to the gym and I had to I had to work out hard because my shirt was off regardless. I think I might have done a couple of nude scenes too. I think Bobby came home when I was in a bath in the middle of the house. I don't know that. I seem to get sent these scenes by mates when they find them on YouTube. And I, I, so half of them I forget. I don't even remember, remember I filmed them. But um, no, any chance, uh, any chance the producers got, they instructed the writers for us to have our kit off. Yep. Was that tough as an actor? Like also, you know, you're, you're learning your lines and worrying about lines, but also when you're at home, you've got to be worrying about what you eat and workouts and keeping the body right. And was, was that a bit no, of a struggle? I grew up playing sport, you know, I played sport well, but wasn't good enough at it to make money out of it, but I had a really good appreciation of it. So with that came a level of fitness and um, I love the feeling of feeling fit. So for me, it wasn't a huge stretch, but, um, and my body, because I'd been fit most of my life, seemed to react pretty well to fitness routines. I used to come to hand pretty quick. Um, but uh, I know other people struggle with it. Um, uh, so it was a real battle for some. Um, and, yeah, look, it can be uncomfortable if you're not feeling your best, particularly the ladies, um, you know, um, if they're not feeling their, their best, but not exclusive to the ladies. Of course, it, it can add an extra layer of complexity if you're not feeling good about yourself. Yeah, definitely. Can you, can you also tell us what else you're up to at the moment and are you involved in any other projects that we could help promote well yeah, great question and thank you um i talked about the feature film that i've written that's uh got to run a process um i'm not doing a crowd fund me although um you know that does seem like um <clears throat> realistic options for some people but i'm yeah. going through the process of um finalizing that script um, and looking at getting some grants so that I can develop that and attach a producer um, and uh, a small punch in, a, in a, a little town was a gorilla shoot so it was a shoot off the grid so to speak but I'm looking at um, at filming this one on the grid so um, maybe just look out for the film called Last Stand um, uh, and apart from the Bring Back Adam Cameron campaign, yeah, that one that we've just found out about, we can all jump on board that one. Um, 
Sign the petition now. <laughs> oh, everyone's too busy saving neighbours at the moment, I think. So I don't think... <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you about that. What, what are your thoughts on the axing of neighbours? Pretty sad. Well... I think the writing was on the move on the wall when 10 moved it to the digital platform. Yeah. Um, look, it's an institution, but at the end of the day, um, it's a business. Um, it's like home and away has created so many jobs, set up so many careers. I don't like watching the news and hearing that the local sausage factory is out of business. Cause that means people are losing their jobs. So with neighbors winding up, Lots of people, some of whom I love, are losing their jobs. So it's sad. Um, yeah. And it is an institution, but most things come to an end. I think if I think if um, the revenue was pulled from under Home and Away, I think Channel 7 would still find a way to make Home and Away because it's one of their pillars. Yeah. Whereas Neighbours on the digital platform, yeah, maybe not. So, look, I wish all the petitions all the luck in the world but um my personal opinion is they're up against it i hope i'm wrong yeah that's true um now about to wrap up but before we do can i just say uh you know we've only just connected in the last few weeks and i've, I've chatted to you a few times but you're an absolute gentleman and this is not to float your boat or anything like that but you've been very supportive of this podcast um you know we've, we've spoken about some things that we'd like to do in the future but yeah, you're a great guy and uh, I really appreciate you coming on to talk with us and, and talking with the fans because you, you, you have a lot of fans out there, especially from the home and away days. And uh, yeah, you're just an absolute gentleman, just a great guy to, to know and who I'm looking forward to get to know a bit more as well. So thank Thanks, you. Matt. Can I just say, Matt and Ken, on this podcast um, that the actors are getting just as much out of this as I hope the fans are because there's very much a market for this sort of nostalgia. And it makes us feel really good to be able to relieve the times, makes us feel appreciated. So um, it's a two-way street. I think what you're doing is amazing. So, And that's why I'm so supportive of it. So thumbs up. Appreciate that, mate. Anything you'd like to add before we go, Ken? What you both said. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Ken. Awesome. That was episode five of Talking Prisoner Presents. Thank you for watching. If you could please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and also share the videos where you can and also like our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the other pages as well. And also this episode of Talking Prisoner will be available across all the podcast platforms, including Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and also on the talkingprisoner.com website. It's been an absolute pleasure, Matt. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys. Thank you, fans. Thank you.